Hi, uh, welcome or welcome back to Stockholm International Youth Science Seminar 2022. This is part two of our three parts today. Uh, my name is Linnea Somnemi and I am the project manager of this year's SIAS. So in SIAS we bring young prominent researchers from all over the world here to Stockholm to present their work for you students. And this is in hopes of inspiring you to do a career in research and also it provides a good foundation for training and to improve your scientific English. It is organized by the Federation of Young Scientists, the Swedish Federation of the Young Scientists, uh, and it is yearly arranged, but it's not everything we do within the organization. We also do summer research schools, Utställningen, which is a competition for high schoolers where you can compete with your high school project. We do a cybersecurity project, we hand out scholarships, support associations, and much, much more. So if you as a student are interested in knowing more what we do, or if you as a teacher want to learn more about our teaching materials, you can visit our webpage, ungafoska.se. So this is, like I said, part two of a three-part series of the seminar. And now we're gonna deep dive into understanding complex systems and sensations. The scientists that are presenting are Jim Alanson from Luleå University, uh, Xiun Sim from Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, Roman Schönholze from Schweizer, Schweizer Jugendforst, and Botond Mesaros from Hungarian Association of Innovation. If you want to learn more about the projects and the participants, we also have posters, reports, and abstracts available online. So you can visit ungafoskase slash science to learn more about the projects. And you are also able to ask questions directly to the participants. There is a questionnaire right next to the broadcasting where you can ask questions today, the 9th, until 4 p.m and the answers will be sent to your signed up teacher tonight. And with that, I hope you enjoy part two of SIAS. Hi, my name is Jim, and I will be presenting my research on stochastic optimization of energy presumption systems. Now, if you don't know what that means, then don't worry, neither did I a couple of years ago but hopefully we will all know just a little bit more after this presentation. So, why am I looking into this? Why is this interesting? Well, as most of us know, the United Nations has set a goal of being carbon dioxide neutral until 2050. Now, this goal has led to an increased share of renewable energy in our electricity grid, which is good, but due to the uncertain nature of renewable energy production, we have started to see larger fluctuations in electricity prices. And this has in turn led to consumers having an incentive to start producing their own electricity and becoming what we call prosumers. Now, the problem with these prosumer systems is that they also use renewable energy to produce their electricity. So they will run into the same problem as the electricity grid, which is why these systems have started to look into if they should store their own electricity. But then the question also becomes, how large should this energy storage be? And is it even worth it to begin with? Well, to answer this question, we need to look into three key parameters, which are electricity demand, supply, and price. But a problem with all three of these parameters is that they are what we call stochastic. So we can't really know the value of these parameters beforehand, because they are dependent on things like the weather and how we act. So how do we calculate the best possible capacity, taking into consideration these stochastic parameters? Well, that's what I'm trying to find out with my research. And to show you how I do this, I will take you through the methodology. So the first thing I do is that I model the system I'm looking at mathematically. And it can look something like this. And don't worry, you do not have to understand all of this. This is just to give you a picture of how it looks. 
So this is the one of the models that I've developed in my research that explains one of these presumption systems. But the problem with these models is that they alone can't really handle these stochastic elements. So we need to expand it somehow. So this model can calculate the capacity, but it can't really consider the stochastic elements. So what I've done is that I've used an additional thing called the sample average approximation algorithm. And it looks something like this. And again, you do not have to understand all of this, but I will give you a quick run through of how this works. So we start with creating a bunch of samples, so a bunch of possible scenarios of our model. Uh, and then we solve the linear optimization problem, so the model that you just saw on the previous slide. And then we note the solution for this model. What we then do is we take the solutions for every sample and we take the average of these solutions and we compare it to the best possible solution found thus far. So the solution with the lowest cost. So if this, this average and if the best solution is sufficiently close to each other, then we can say that the best solution is a good approximation of our system. So we continue with that solution. Now, by using these methods that I just showed you, so the optimization model and the sample average approximation algorithm, we can start getting some results. So what I did is I took a real life case and implemented it on these two models, and I got some results. So I will take you through the results on a very general level. So one of the results that my research showed was that energy storage can be a viable option to increase both profitability and self-sufficiency of these prosumer systems. Now, another thing that it showed was that higher fluctuations in electricity price, demand and supply, so the more uncertain we are about these parameters, well, the, the more we benefit from the energy storages. So the higher the fluctuations, the larger the energy storage tended to be. Now, another thing that I saw was that this stochasticity really matters. So if we ignore that we have stochastic parameters, and just take the values from, let's say, a previous year, then we will get a whole nother solution than if we actually consider that these stochastic parameters can differ. And if we take this stochastic solution, then we will, on average, get a more profitable solution than if we don't. So, to give you a quick summary of this short presentation, I will give you some key takeaways. So, the first, first is which a high share of renewable energy has led to uncertainties in electricity production, which has led to increased electricity prices, which, which in turn has given an incentive for consumers to start producing and store their own electricity. And to calculate this capacity of the energy storages, I have used mathematical optimization and the sample average approximation algorithm to calculate the capacity. And what I found out was that an energy storage can be used to improve prosumer system's profitability and self-sufficiency. Now, with that said, I would like to thank you all for listening and tuning in to this short presentation. Good morning, my name is Jun Shim and I'm a graduate student at KAIST. Today, I'm going to brief you on my research that explores the biological world. Among the various methods of studying biological systems, imaging is a powerful tool that provides the most intuitive visual information. Even though the biological structures are too small to be seen with your naked eye, you can easily observe them under a microscope. Researchers have developed various imaging technologies to study smaller and smaller structures. Expansion microscopy, or EXM, is also one of the state-of-the-art imaging methods. Unlike the other methods that use advanced equipment, EXM enables nanoscale imaging with only, uh, by simply using a conventional microscope. So how is this possible? As the name implies, expansion microscopy physically expands the sample so we can easily identify small biomolecules inside the sample. The key to making the most of EXM is by using a swellable hydrogel. Hydrogels are common material that can, uh, that can retain large amounts of water. And you can easily find hydrogels in baby diapers. 
at the molecular level, hydrogel can be described as a uh, three-dimensional molecule network. They are initially dry, but quickly swell as, they mo uh, as water molecules are stored between this network. And if we synthesize this uh, hydrogel inside a biological sample, this molecular network will be densely formed throughout the entire sample. During this process, um, biomolecules inside the sample are also incorporated into the network. So once the hydrogel expands as it absorbs the water, biomolecules hanging in this network are separated from each other. As a result, it is now possible to see every single biomolecule under a conventional microscope. So this is the how expansion microscopy works. Since its development of 2015, scientists have usually applied this technology to cells and tissue slices. And uh, what I want to do was apply this wonderful technology to the most complex and therefore most uh, challenging biological samples, the whole vertebrae. Thus, why don't we just expand the whole organism instead of seeing just small parts of it? Unfortunately, the idea of expanding the whole organism, especially for the whole vertebrate using a hydrogel, is easier said than done. One obvious problem is comes from the different mechanical properties of hydrogel and the sample. Hydrogels are very fragile and soft material, while vertebrates are very tough material that containing bones and muscles. So if we try to expand the whole organism using hydrogel, soft organs such as brain may expand, but hot, hard body parts such as the bone and muscles will resist, and as a result, the sample um, might be permanently damaged. Therefore, I had to come up with a step-by-step -step new protocols for dissolving and softening the bone tissues so that all components of our body will expand uniformly inside the hydrogel. So, after two years of errors, uh, I was able to make it possible and name the protocol as whole body expansion microscopy. And as you can see from the workflow, it involves complicated and lengthy chemical process, but I'm not going to explain all the details here. Instead, I'd like to show you some examples of whole body EXM imaging. First, I applied whole body EXM to uh, mouse embryos at different embryonic stages and successfully visualized all the anatomical details throughout the entire body. And looking at this session, we can see the 3D structure of whole intact body, um, as well as the surrounding its organs and connections between them. If only the heart is taken out of the body and observed as it usually done, the information about these uh, organic relationships will be lost. Furthermore, if we observe them in an increasing um, magnifications, we can also find the muscle tissues and like single muscle fibers and even uh, individual organelles such as mitochondria. And this is the first time that an intact whole animal has been visualized at such a high resolution. So, to where does this all lead? Biological systems is like an orchestra. Many instruments making, together, making noise together doesn't necessarily create music. Only when they play together as a team can we hear a beautiful symphony. And our bodies work in the same way uh, as an orchestra. There are complex uh, hierarchies made up more than a billion biomolecules, and every component of our body dynamically interact with each other to create the biological phenomena. Therefore, to fully understand of how uh, these biological systems, we need the broader pictures of how they work as a team. So in this regard, I believe that whole body EXM would um, allow us one step, move to one step closer to truly understanding of biological systems. And I hope that one day, uh, this research will contribute to making our lives healthier and happier. Thank you.
Hello everybody, welcome to my presentation on essential oils and the effect they can have on our body and on our minds. Especially we're going to look at the essential oil of lavender and rosemary. So essential oil and the power of essential oil has been used for a very long time and it is still used today a lot. There are a lot of products out there, especially cosmetics, that use essential oils and promise to help you sleep better or have a relaxing an anti-stress or even a tonifying effect. But how is it possible that essential oils or smells in general can affect how we feel? So actually, odors, emotions and uh, memories are strongly linked because they are all processed in a part of the brain called the limbic system, which you can see here. And that is why when you smell the scent of a sweet cake, this can uh, make you remember Christmas with your grandmother and evoke in you a feeling of happiness. So I wanted to measure and quantize this effect, and especially I wanted to uh, measure this effect that essential oils could have. So for that, I did an experiment, and I needed 85 participants who were blind tested, which means that they didn't know what I was gonna test on them. And they inhaled one of the three following oils. So 30 participants inhaled lavender oil, which is known to have a calming and relaxing effect. And then 30 more participants uh, inhaled rosemary oil, which is known to have a contrary effect, so it is more energizing and revitalizing. And the last group uh, inhaled almond oil, which uh, was used as a placebo, so as a control group. And as I said, my goal was to measure the effects on our body and on our emotions. And for the part on the body, I decided to uh, test different uh, physiological parameters such as uh, blood pressure, heart rate, and oxygen saturation. And I measured um, these parameters before and after the 10-minute inhalation, and then I compared uh, both results. For the emotional responses, I constructed a survey, which again the participants took before and after the inhalation so that they could compare both results. So what did all of this show? So first for the physiological parameters, I saw that uh, the blood pressure was the only one that was significantly changed. Also only the persons inhaling uh, lavender essential oil showed a significant reduction in blood pressure, which points to a calming and relaxing effect. The people inhaling rosemary or the placebo didn't show any uh, changes. Then for the results on the emotions, uh, so here on the table you can see that the emotions, uh, the significant changes are put in bold, so these three. And you can see that lavender uh, had a positive effect on the well-being and the serenity, and that rosemary affected the well-being also positively. Again, the placebo didn't show any changes. So what should you remember from my presentation? So we saw that uh, lavender essential oil and rosemary essential oil can indeed uh, affect our body and especially our emotions. But I have to add that the results were rather small. But still, next time you're feeling sad or anxious, just remember that inhaling some lavender oil or rosemary oil make, uh, can make you feel better. So thank you for your attention. Hi everyone, I'm Moton Mészáros, a master student in mathematics at Ötvös Lorány University Budapest, and my goal here is to introduce you to my research uh, entitled Model Space Reduction of Deterministic System with Nonlinear Time Evolution. Don't worry, we will be talking about very natural concepts. Personally, I feel that dealing with complex systems is interesting and fun, but that's not all. In fact, the problem of efficient modeling of complex systems is one of today's greatest scientific challenges. If I wanted to illustrate the difference between possessing and the obsess of this knowledge, I will turn to historical examples. We have seen the collapse of many uh, developed societies in the past, such as the Babylonian, <coughs> Egyptian and the Roman Empire. These civilizations encompassed many geographical areas, and developed complex diplomatic and supply systems between together. And as a result, the problems and diseases hitting remote areas affected uh, societies simultaneously. So the failure to understand these complex systems that were governing their daily lives proved fatal for these societies. But back to present day. Currently, many eminent scientists are working on developing general frameworks for understanding complex systems. 
but the problem is orders of magnitude harder than in the days of our pre predecessors. We have built systems of unprecedented complexity, such as banking system and climate systems, energy supply systems, economic systems, and population systems, and we want to understand them. And the question is, how can we do that? Before moving forward, it is nice to clarify the concepts. The idea of a system is easy to understand. It's a collection of elements which are interacting with each other in maybe non-trivial way, which results in the emergence of beautiful patterns and regularities. There are essentially three properties that can transform a system into a complex one. That is a huge number of elements, uh, nonlinear interaction, and randomness. If no randomness appears, the system is deterministic. And we call the number of elements dimension because it is a very uh, important concept. So the question is how to understand high dimensional complex systems. And now that we know th what a deterministic complex system is, time has arrived to appreciate every attempt to understand them. Theoretically, there shouldn't be any problem. We just have to list all the elements and follow the interactions. But think of a real example. As an example, a human brain that we do not understand, it contains 86 billion neurons. Even listing each of these elements will take a lifetime at least, and sadly not even our computational technology makes us capable for performing these computations. So we seemingly remain unarmed in a battle fought for understanding the future before it happens. Still, everything is not lost. Very often, when dealing with high-dimensional complex system, we are actually interested in a lower number of quantities that can be expressed as a function of the states, and we are interested in the time evolution of that. Finding the inner dynamics of the new, lower-dimensional system becomes a key issue. If we happen to perform this reduction, problems that were previously thought to be impossible to solve may suddenly become solvable. Previously, scientists have tried to solve the problem by returning to the high-dimensional state, performing a step there, and returning to the low-dimensional one. And that was a problem because uh, the time development of the system in the original high-dimensional sta state is still too complex, we didn't solve the problem, but there appeared an even much more fundamental problem, namely that we cannot go back. In general, unless we are dealing with linear mappings, the pseudo-inverse does not exist. In fact, the problem of linear pseudo-inverting was solved by Roger Penrose, Nobel laureate in physics 2020. And in my research, I found a loophole to describe the time evolution of the low dimensional system so the idea was to represent the mapping itself and not the states. And as a result, I created a mathematical framework using which I can represent the time evolution of the high dimensional system in the low dimensional one, thus opening the way to understand much more efficient uh, robust nonlinear networks such as AI itself. And it turned out that very similar problems appear in many other disciplines. So in the future, I'm trying to use that to understand all these complicated systems that are all around us. Finally, I would like to thank you for your attention and for the possibility to be here. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you.